history of catapults. Okay. Um, the first catapult was built in 400 BC. It was built by Dionysus the Elder in Greece. Uh, he built it, and he built a stone hurling catapult, which is not this one. Um, and it was, and then catapults were a staple of medieval warfare for at least a millennia. There's different types of catapults. There's three different types of catapults. The first one is the the stone hurling one. The second one was. Um, the second one was this type of one. It's called a mang mango mango nella, I think. Um, it was also built in 400 BC. And the third type is the ballista, and that's just like a giant cross. This one, uh, the first one is a trebuchet, tri I think. Trebuchet. Trebuchet. No. <laughs> a trebuchet. Um, that's the one that Dionysus the Elder made, and it's the stone hurling one. Uh, it has a long arm attached to a fulcrum with one short, uh, one short or significantly shorter, a shorter one, like down here, that is rotates uh, about an axis. Um, uh, attached to the shorter arm is a weight that um, helps launch the whole thing. Um, the trebuchet works entirely on gravitational potential energy. When the sling is pulled to the ground, the counterbalance is filled with the weight up in the air. The potential energy of the counterbalance powers the whole system. The second one is a mag magnol. Magnol. It's the one that we all built when we did that physics thing, because that's kind of the only tool they gave us. It is um, has one long arm with a bucket attached to it and it is pulled down to 90 degrees to, um, to slink up the whatever you're throwing. This one uses uh, potential energy because it's based on position of where this is. Um, it uses the tension of the rope or um, rubber band in this case to create that potential energy to launch your thing. Um, the ballista is not necessarily a catapult. It's more like a crossbow because it shoots arrows. It um, has a rope that connects to the end of two pieces of wood. Um, it's pulled back and held in place while the bolt and arrow or dart is put in place. The potential energy is stored in the tension of the rope and bent up the arms of the bow. Tension acts as the spring. The, con the K constant is different for each rope slash arm and must be determined experimentally. And then this is just um, someone explaining it better than I can. It's, um, you know that show on the Science Channel, Pumpkin Chunkin', where they just throw pineapples all over the place? Oh, not pineapples, pumpkins all over the place? Um, this is the science behind me? Do you like watching fruit explode and also enjoy physics? Well, if so, there's probably only one place in the world where those two great tastes come together. Pumpkin Junkin, America's annual contest to see whose homemade machine can hurl a pumpkin the farthest. Every November, thousands of amateur engineers, equal parts Da Vinci and Gallagher, converge on a farm in Delaware to put their contraptions to the test. They compete in divisions based on what kind of machine they've built, and whoever's device hurls their squash the farthest wins. The only rule, no explosives. Yeah, I know, a little bit disappointing there. But never underestimate physics. When its awesome powers are unleashed, it can make even a seemingly simple machine cause a lot of squash damage and look good doing it. The machines at the Pumpkin Chunkin' Festival rely on the release of stored energy to get the pumpkin airborne. This energy comes from some external force that's exerted on a part of the machine where it's been pent up as potential energy. For example, there are the air cannons which release all at once the potential energy of gas that's slowly been pressurized inside a container. And then there's what the contest calls centrifugal machines where a motor spins the pumpkin around the tether, which is pretty cool, even though centrifugal force is not a thing. But from where I stand, the most delightful Pumpkin Chunkin' physics are found in the class of machines that you probably know as catapults. Yes, they're not just for smashing castles or a cats. There are actually many different kinds of catapults, including the 
mangonels, trebuchets, and torsion machines, each using a slightly different sort of force to create the potential energy. When you think of a catapult, what you're probably seeing in your head is a mangonel. Its main feature is a long beam with a bucket on one end and the other fastened to an axle. The bucket into the beam is usually attached to a sling by the machine's main frame, then it's pulled down to apply the force of tension. This tension is what stores up the machine's potential energy until it's released. For bucket chunkers, though, catapults can use springs, cords, rubber, or dead weights to apply tension, but they've added an extra touch of genius to their traditional mangonel. Instead of a bucket on the end, what it has is a sling. What's the genius in that? Well, it gives the machine a second fulcrum, or pivot point. The first fulcrum being where the beam meets the axle. But when that's released, it throws up the sling, which amplifies the power of the first fulcrum. This is all very similar to how trebuchets work, but they're a little more sophisticated, you know, as far as catapults go. Rather than holding all the potential energy at the tip of the beam, where the pumpkin is, trebuchets rely on a counterweight at the other end. Again, the beam is pulled down to set the device, but instead of tension being the force at work here, it's simply gravity. The heavier your counterweight is and the higher you lift it, the more force you get out when it falls. As a result, trebuchets are much more efficient, they tend to shoot a lot farther, and are more accurate, giving you more chunk for your buck. Finally, you have what the hardcore chunkers call torsion machines. Most of these kinds of catapults are hybrids of the first two. They have a sling at the pumpkin end, just like a trebuchet, but instead of gravity, they use the force of tension, like a mangonel. Unlike with a mangonel, though, the tension is applied to this machine by twisting a length of rope around the bottom of the beam. It's the same idea as twisting the rubber band on a propeller toy airplane. The twisting, or torsion, is just tension applied in a rotating direction instead of straight up and down. And we all know what happens from there. But please don't try this at home unless you have a scale bottle or something. Just watch from the safety of your sofa. Don't miss Pumpkin Chunk in this Thanksgiving, November 22nd at 8 p.m. only on Science Channel. And for more Pumpkin Carnage, check out sciencechannel.com slash chunk. 